Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, uh, where tonight we're going to be talking about the Minnesota Institute for Minim Minimally Invasive Surgery uh, in the Crosby Ironton Regional Medical Center. I guess we don't say Crosby Ironton, but the Crosby Regional Medical Center is the correct Cuyuna term? Or the Cuyuna. Center. Sorry about that. We get it right. My guests this evening are two surgeons from that center. Uh, Dr. Uh, Howard McAllister is a chief of surgeons, mm -hmm. and he has been on our show before, and we appreciate your coming back and submitting yourself to this again. <laughs> it's nice to be here, Ray. And his, uh, to his right is Andrew Lovett, who is the, one of the newer surgeons at the center. Welcome to both of you. Before we get started, maybe you could just give a little bit of a background of yourself so we can, the viewers can have an idea who you are. Well, I, I am trained as a, as a general surgeon, and uh, in the course of my 40 years of practice, I've been through various evolutions, including traditional general surgery, then rural general surgery, and uh, then uh, advanced minimally invasive surgery, and now robotic surgery. So it's been quite an evolution over that period of time. And, and how about you? Sure. Uh, you know, I was born and raised actually in Maine. Um, completed my training out in New Jersey, and then uh, last year I had the opportunity to come to the Minnesota Institute of Minimally Invasive Surgery for fellowship training, uh, which for those that aren't familiar is just an extra year, very advanced, uh, specialized training. I completed that with Dr. McAllister, Dr. Severson, Dr. Roberts, and Dr. Lemire, who are all the surgeons over there, and uh, had a great experience, so my wife and I decided to stay here, and we're lucky enough to have the opportunity. And you were saying that you have how many surgeons now at, at Cuyuna? Fifteen surgeons. Fifteen I think, surgeons. Uh, on that's staff. that's incredible, for an area the size of, of where you're working. I mean, that well, really it's, is. it's 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 in all surgical specialties. Yeah, it's uh, it's especially remarkable given where we came from thirty years ago when we had two surgeons on the staff. So, and how long has Cuyuna Regional Medical Center been that center itself? Uh, Nineteen. Oh, uh, they just we just celebrated our. 50-year uh, anniversary two or three years ago, so uh, 50 years or thereabouts. Wow. So you've seen a lot of changes in your time there, um, a so, lot of changes not only in your medical staff but in the national health care scene. That's, that's probably some of the biggest changes that we're all experiencing, isn't it? It's, it's been tough keeping up with not just the advances in surgery but the advances in, uh, in uh, the politics and the uh, paperwork and the regulatory environment. Those things have been have been uh, difficult to keep up with. It's a lot to juggle. And Andrew, I would guess that coming from Maine, you have some of the same climate in Very Maine. Very similar. So uh, it's a little a... snowier in Maine, actually, from my experience so far, but certainly a little bit colder here. Um, I'm down from near the ocean, so. And, um, and where did you actually take your medical training? So I did my uh, medical schooling at University of New England, which is in Maine, uh, and then my residency program was down in New Jersey, uh, outside of Philadelphia. Okay. so. Talk a little bit about how this technology is changing. I mean, how you used to just cut us open <laughs> and do the surgery. It's really, really revolutionized, isn't it? It really has. In about 1987 was where that revolution began to take place. When we started, uh, you know, as my, in my training, uh, there was really very little in the way of laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery. And the idea was you had to make an incision in someone's body that was big enough for you and your assistant to get all of your hands in to do the work. Now we do that same surgery through just little tiny incisions, and the results have really been uh, significant. Uh, patients uh, oftentimes, if it's not outpatient surgery, only spend a day or two in the hospital. Pain has decreased, complications are decreased. Uh, it's been a remarkable evolution, and that has continued over the years uh, and uh, has progressed to the point of robotic surgery as well, which is kind of an extension of minimally invasive surgery done with a machine rather than with human hands. Talk a little bit about your fellowship programs. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of us understand what that is. Well, surgical training is very complex and getting increasingly so. In the United States, there are 172 uh, accredited fellowship programs, programs that are accredited to teach advanced techniques in minimally invasive surgery. 
Um, in Minnesota, there are three. There's us in the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Clinic. Um, and uh, what we do, the concept is to provide one year of advanced surgical training. We're accredited to uh, certify our fellows in, in uh, minimally invasive surgery uh, and in bariatric surgery and flexible endoscopy. And Dr. Lovett has uh, been going through that this past year. I'm sure he has a, a take on, on how that all worked. And how does it work? It must be a little awkward when you're starting to do this kind of surgery for the first time. It is, and you know, I, Dr. McAllister's being humble in that um, we've at MIMIS, or Minnesota Institute, done minimally invasive surgery for many years, but that's not to say that there isn't lots of old-fashioned open general surgery still being done out there. Uh, and certain, certainly in my training and residency, I encounter that where, you know, there's certainly laparoscopic minimally invasive surgery being done, uh, but not to the extent that we do it at Cuyuna. Um, and it was just, you know, one year really kind of polished off all my skills and, and added, I can't even list the number of new skills that I gained in that short year, uh, as opposed to even a five-year residency that I was building on. So. so you really have good mentorship. I, I mean, that's really kind of how you get through oh, this program. Yeah, with absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> that was one of the, the big reasons that I decided to stay, is I mm -hmm. really love working with everyone there. Uh, the surgeons, the staff, the hospital, it's mm -hmm. a really nice place to be. It's a fellowship is sort of an apprenticeship in, in mm -hmm. many ways in that, that it's a very collegial environment and uh, we're basically committed to passing on the experience and the knowledge that we've gained over the last 30 years or so. And I know you do a lot of different kinds of surgeries, but bariatric surgery is one of the areas of your expertise. Could you want to just talk a little bit about that? Weight loss surgery is, a, is a, a, an important concept, an important part of what we do. Uh, there are uh, probably 40% of the U.S. population is obese, um, and that doesn't uh, show any signs of decreasing anytime soon. Uh, the, one of the problems with that is, uh, is that there are associated illnesses that go along with that. Uh, things like uh, sleep apnea, uh, heart disease, some types of cancer, and, uh, and diabetes, which has been a uh, had a remarkable increase uh, over the last uh, 25 years or thereabouts. In 1955, I think about 1% of the population had type 2 diabetes. And I think this past year, almost 10% of the U.S. population uh, has had that. So it's 30 million people. That's uh, a tremendously debilitating disease and can be difficult to manage. It goes I, along with obesity. That's amazing when you think about it. It's just absolutely amazing. So when you do bariatric surgery, what is it that you're actually doing? What we're trying to do is, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to affect weight loss uh, just on the basis of lifestyle change alone, because it's very hard to just wake up one morning and say, well, you know, I think I'll just change my lifestyle. I'm gonna eat healthy and exercise regularly and stuff like that. What weight loss surgery does is it helps people to, to affect that weight loss, to, to actually, or that lifestyle change, to be able to, uh, what we tell patients is, is that the operation is not going to make them lose weight. It will help them to change their lifestyle and that will make them lose weight. It's, um, it's a, mis a mixed bag, as in I have friends who have gone through that and they got the same old habits, got, got into the same old habits and started gaining that weight back. So as you said, it's, it's a lifestyle start and you have to be, at a certain stage to be, uh, at least from Medicare or from the health insurance perspective, you have to be a certain weight, certain BMI to even qualify for that, don't you? You have to have a, you have to have a, uh, you have to be morbidly obese. You have to have uh, a body mass index greater than 40 or greater than 35 if there are associated illnesses like diabetes or heart disease or joint disease or something like that. And that BMI is pretty easy to figure out, isn't it? Basically, uh, there are, are calculators all over on websites and a variety of places. It's basically your height and your weight. I mean, that kind of gives you a rough idea, doesn't it? it? It's based on body surface area, and you can calculate that based on height and weight and get approximation of it. Body mass index has some, um, I mean, it's not, it's a very rough guide. It's not, uh, it, it is not a hard and fast number that uh, is extraordinarily accurate. But I think when applied to the, to the general population, it has some validity in terms of large populations of people. And do you have average ages of, of people that do this, or is it just all ages that you deal with? Our, our center, we're an accredited center of excellence, and, and, but we're certified uh, for uh, adult 
Uh, so patients younger than age 18 or thereabouts uh, is not something we do. That's kind of a specialized area, and there are only a couple of centers in Minnesota that actually do that. But uh, we're focused mainly on adults uh, in, in that uh, obese category. Yeah. So do you basically, in this surgery, do you go in and reduce the size of the stomach? Is that basically what you do? Or how, how does that work? That's part of it. Um, there's a couple of different techniques that we can do. Uh, the two most common, uh, one is called the sleeve gastrectomy. And that is where we are essentially just reducing the, the portion of the stomach. The other that we do commonly is the ruin y gastric bypass, uh, which is really the classical kind of traditional surgery. Um, and in that part, um, surgery, we are reducing the size of the stomach to a, a small pouch, uh, and also we're reconfiguring some of the intestine. Um, both of these surgeries, um, beyond just reducing the size, uh, which we would call a restrictive effect, meaning you physically can't eat as much at one time, they also have very profound uh, hormonal effects. Um, when we uh, either at size part of the stomach or reroute the um, direction that the food goes uh, initially, uh, there's uh, immediate hormonal effects. Uh, oftentimes we'll see people with profound diabetes even by the time they're out of the hospital on a much lower dose of insulin or their medications, um, which obviously hasn't, become, uh, hasn't come from the weight loss alone. It's because of those hormonal effects that also accompany these surgeries. So you see that diabetes changing already? Very quickly, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And when you have folks that go through this surgery, do you have a a support program for them to help them Absolutely. work through this and process? That's, you know, beyond this, uh, that's probably the most important part is the support program. Um, leading up to the surgery, uh, there's certainly uh, insurance requirements uh, based on uh, a certain number of nutritional visits, a certain number of uh, visits to various specialties to make sure that you're mentally and physically prepared for the surgery. Um, but, you know, I would say that those beyond being insurance requirements, really should be requirements for the surgery in general because it's a profound uh, change to your life. Uh, and certainly the people that do best are the people that continue to engage in some type of support group or uh, keep the lifestyle modifications in mind. As Dr. McAllister said, it's kind of, it resets your life for six months to a year and really helps you lose the weight. But beyond that, you really need to uh, continue to continue the lifestyle uh, modifications. As you mentioned, it's a, it's a mixed bag. It's yeah. some patients do better than others, and uh, the uh, it, it mainly reflects the commitment to the lifestyle change that's necessary. The operation is not going to make people lose weight. It will help them to lose weight. It makes it possible for them to lose mm -hmm. weight. But they have to still do the effort, make the effort. They still have to do the work. Um, so uh, it's very successful, um, but not 100% successful. There are people who regain weight. Uh, it's rare in our practice that they regain all of their weight, um, but uh, it is not uh, uncommon to see people regain some of their weight as the years go by after this is done. And do you do a lot of follow-up to kind of see how successful this has been? Do you keep track of the patients that you worked with? We keep very close track of them. Uh, we want to see them back yearly for the rest of their life, uh, and certainly very frequently in that first year but we want to keep track of the uh, various potential complications, nutritional complications and those types of things. In many cases, because we have so many patients come from long distances, the, uh, we work with their primary care doctors in their own facility, so they don't have to drive all the way back up to see us just for a 15 minute visit. Now, is that surgery usually done minimally too then? Absolutely. It is? Oh, yeah. Wow. And that must be a challenge if somebody, uh, you see the size of some people, there are people who are very huge. That must be kind of a challenge to get into that, through that body fat to do that. Is it that can be, but there's certainly, you know, very well-established techniques. And uh, again, that's why we're specializing in this, because mm -hmm. we've learned those techniques. And um, it's, it, it's completely doable. Yep. It's, um, you know, and uh, once you're on the inside, it kind of, we can get it done. It's, it's amazing. I, I was with a heart specialist this summer who's from not from the area, but we're talking about what it's like just if you go to the Minnesota State Fair, for example, and you see the obesity walking down the streets. It's just really mind-boggling. And it, I still like the old Lone Ranger shows because <laughs> they play those old reruns on TV in black and white. And you hardly ever see an actor that's overweight from the 50s and the 60s. I mean, I'm sure there were overweight people, but like you said, not 
to the degree in which they are now. No, it's been a remarkable. Uh, it's been a remarkable shift in the demographics of obesity, and it has been a, an alarming increase over the last 25 years or thereabouts. Um, it's, uh, it tends to be regionally variable. Minnesota is not even one of the most prominent states relative right. to the percentage of obese people. Uh, I think that that's a, a, an honor that's reserved largely for some of the southern states. But uh, certainly uh, we uh, contribute our share. Mm -hmm. How about, and I know this is a huge topic, heartburn and reflux issues. Talk a little bit about what you folks do there. That's a huge, that's a huge uh, uh, area, and it's very undertreated. It's one of the most common reasons why people see their primary care doctors, and uh, the various medications that are used to treat that to suppress acid uh, are some of the most popular and, and uh, uh, hottest selling uh, medications on the market, particularly now that they're over the over the counter. Um, and uh, what we have we have always been uh, done a lot of work relative to uh, to managing reflux disease, but I think over the last four or five years, uh, we have really kind of coalesced that into uh, a formal center, a coordinated approach to the diagnosis and the treatment of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's been a very rewarding thing, and, and we've really uh, had a lot of success with that and a lot of response. We've got people that come to us literally from all over the state uh, and from all over the upper Midwest states. region. Hmm. And what are some of the techniques you use when you're treating that reflux? So the, I would add that the coordinated effort that we use for the reflux is really unique. And uh, in fact, you know, my family's from Maine. I was anticipating going back there, and there's just there's nothing even similar to what they do uh, at the Missouri Reflux and Heartburn Center in Crosby and, and in Riverwood, um, anywhere that I've seen. Really, um, a lot of this test the the key component to doing proper reflux surgery is the testing and making a proper diagnosis. And a lot of this testing can take weeks to months uh, in multiple various different specialties, different hospitals, different clinic visits, uh, where many times we can do it all in one day at our center. Uh, and making that diagnosis is the key component. That's, that's a good point. One of the things that we try to bring to the table you know how it is when you go to the doctor. The doctor says, we need this test or you need to see this specialist, but you can't see him or her for two weeks or three weeks or two months. And so that happens and then they want to do testing and that schedules for, gets scheduled for two months down the road or two weeks down the road or something. It, it's a, a very cumbersome process. And what we want to try to do is to do this efficiently, try to do it all in one setting or in a short time frame if we can, so that the patient's needs are met on this. Most of these people are pretty miserable by the time they come to see us. So you come in and you've got heartburn and reflux issues. It, you almost have to go down and look, don't you, to really be able to diagnose what the problem is? Well, that's where Absolutely. we start. So it, you can do that and you usually take a mild sedative or something when you do that to relax the throat? It's completely painless. Uh, it's done with the patient uh, sedated, uh, basically asleep. They don't feel a thing. It takes us about 10 or 15 minutes to do the examination and, and the associated testing uh, to gather the data necessary to understand what's going on. We do what's called a comprehensive esophageal evaluation that starts with the upper GI endoscopy uh, and the uh, various testing associated with that, but there are a couple other tests that we do as well to try to put a fine point on it to make sure we understand everything there is to understand about a person's esophagus and their lower esophageal sphincter and the reasons why they're having reflux and figure out the best way to manage it, whether it be surgery or whether it be with medical treatment. And I also say if in fact they are having reflux, there's a lot of people out there on uh, medication for reflux that aren't, don't actually have any and the medication is not helping them. So oh, really? Our goal is to, you know, treat their reflux certainly if it's there, but if it's not there, then to get them off of unnecessary medications. And, and I've read that some of those medications can actually be harmful if you're taking for long periods of time. They certainly can over time. Um, you know, if you actually go through and read the little packet literature when you get your um, over-the-counter medications, which I'm sure most people don't, they're really only supposed to be used for about two weeks at a time. Um, and of course, we know many, many people have been on these for years and years and years. Uh, and there's starting to be some data that there's side effects from that, uh, which is unsurprising. Um, some correlation with uh, kidney disease, heart disease, um, uh, some even dementia, and some even some correlation with um, earlier death. These are all very preliminary studies, sure. but it's, it's there and really any medication, you know, it's uns not too surprising. They are preliminary, but, but since uh, 2010, there have been six black box warnings from the Food and Drug Administration on that particular class of drugs omeprazole and that, uh, that group. 
And uh, so we pay attention to that, but I think more importantly in this age of Dr. Google, uh, the patients are paying more attention to these types of things as well. So those are questions that we commonly get uh, about that. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you Google omeprazole, I think the first eight or 10 hits on that are gonna be from attorneys. Um, because of the potential side effects that can go along with these medications over a period of time. It's not solid data, it's not a, a for sure thing, but it's enough that it has our attention, we have to pay attention to it. The other thing that we worry about with reflux disease is, the, is its contribution to esophageal cancer. The, uh, since uh, in the last 30 years, there's been a 600% increase in the incidence of esophageal cancer. Now, that's a scary statistic, particularly when you compare it to the other forms of cancer that have been relatively stable or only mildly increasing over that same period of time. There's an epidemic of esophageal cancer that's very alarming and it's preventable. It's related directly to the incidence of reflux disease. So, and I know everybody's individually different, but what's causing this reflux increase? Is it our diet? Is it what? Obesity, I think, plays obesity a huge Obesity is role. a big part of it. Right, to, <clears throat> to circle back to obesity, but I think that, that the uh, anatomic changes that go along with accumulating that much fat inside the abdominal cavity plays a significant role in the amount of reflux that people have. So those two particular diseases go hand in hand. And uh, we see that uh, very commonly associated with our bariatric patients. And we see in our bariatric patients a very high incidence of reflux disease. And in fact, a number of the patients that come to see us to be treated for reflux disease end up being treated for their obesity. So it would be probably fair to say that most normal weighted people don't have this high incidence of it anyway. I don't know if that's accurate. I would say that it's more accurate to say that, that um, the incidence of reflux disease certainly increases with increasing weight, with increasing incidence of obesity, yeah. So when you've identified a problem, what are some of the treatment options that you do? So like Dr. McAllister said, uh, you know, we can use medications, uh, and certainly we always try to tailor that so that it's the proper regimen uh, based on when people are having their reflux episodes. Um, but certainly, you know, as, as surgeons, uh, we would like to get them off their medications, and there's numerous surgical techniques. Um, we uh, specialize in one procedure called the Lynx device, uh, which is a, a small magnetic beads uh, that actually go around the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter is the muscle that's there that's supposed to keep the acid down in the stomach and out of the esophagus. So what that set of beads does is it actually reinforces that, uh, and it's just strong enough so that you can swallow all right, but it doesn't let that acid back up. Hmm. Uh, that's been, a, a, that's been a, a really revolutionary concept in the treatment of reflux disease, um, mainly because it doesn't come with the, associate, the associated side effects of some of the other operations that we do, number one. And uh, number two, it is, uh, it's an outpatient operation. It's a, it's a very straightforward, oh, really? pretty straightforward operation. It's done mi with using minimally invasive surgery, but uh, again, most patients go home on the same day. So that's, so that's good. We do try to, uh, surgery typically in reflux disease and the treatment of it is, is a last resort. I mean, that's, if we can control people's symptoms and eliminate the risk of esophageal cancer using medical treatment without surgical treatment, then that's, that's certainly our preference. But there are a number of patients who don't respond to medications, uh, who don't respond to the lifestyle changes and the other types of things that go along with that. Um, and uh, surgery is an option for those particular patients. There are a number of patients for example, whose symptoms are fairly well controlled on medication, but they don't want to take the risk of the side effects of that medication, or just don't want to take the medication um, and opt for surgery instead, and that's a valid reason to do that. So when you put those beads in a person, is that for life? Yeah. It is. Unless we take it out. And, and what would be a reason that you might take it out? There, in some cases, uh, if somebody has difficulty swallowing or ongoing mm -hmm. difficulty swallowing that, that goes along with that, then that's uh, one reason we would do that. Typically, it would not be unusual. I think the, the explantation rate for that device is in the neighborhood of about 1%. Uh, one out of 100 people may not be able to tolerate that device long term, which is similar to other types of uh, surgical procedures as well. So it's pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, pretty low. So you do uh, gynecology, obstetrics, what, what are some of the things you do there? I can't say it, but. Well, we, Dr. Lovett and I aren't obstetricians or gynecologists. Uh, that's a, 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 a land of mystery to us. Uh, but we do have, <laughs> but we do have uh, partners uh, there that uh, specialize in that at uh, Cayenne Regional Medical Center 
that do an excellent job and uh, and similar to uh, to MEMIS, they uh, apply a wide variety of advanced surgical techniques to gynecologic disease. And uh, you do some work with a da Vinci robot. Maybe could you explain to us what that is and what kind of surgeries you do with that? Dr. Lovett is the chairman of that uh, committee. I'll, I'll pass that off so, to him. Yeah, the da Vinci robot, um, a misperception is that we're not controlling it. Certainly, we use the robot as a tool uh, and we are controlling it at all times. We don't turn the robot loose it certainly on the does not. <laughs> to, to do its own thing on that. So, but what, that, what the robot really allows us to do is, is two things. Number one, better visualization. Um, when we perform traditional laparoscopic procedures, it's on a, a flat TV screen essentially, uh, and really you do lack a little bit of depth perception. Now over time with training, you, you make up for that and it's okay. Um, the da Vinci robot is in stereoscopic or 3D view. Um, so when we, look at, when we look through that lens, it's like looking inside the patient's body uh, in real perspective. The da Vinci robot also has what we call wristed instruments. Uh, traditional laparoscopic instruments are straight um, and it, it does limit our ability to do some things. Uh, the da Vinci robot we control and it has a, an actual wrist on the end of the instrument. So we can suture upside down and, and get in finer areas, uh, it just allows us to be a little more facile and operate in just a little bit more detail. It's, uh, it's laparoscopic surgery, as we've been doing for all these decades, but it uh, allows us to apply a little bit, the robot allows us to apply a little bit more precision to some of the things, and that is not, that's important uh, for some types of operations that we do. And how many of your surgeons are trained to do that? With uh, the Da Vinci, by the January, all five of us will be. Wow, so. that's incredible! And and just generally, what kind of surgeries do you usually do with that? Like gallbladder or? Yeah, you know, <laughs> any traditional laparoscopic surgery certainly can be done. Um, uh, our focus is kind of turning towards hernias in the upper GI oh. surgeries um, uh, that Dr. McAllister was talking about. Um, but sir, any laparoscopic surgery can be done with the robot. All the operations that we do within the abdominal cavity typically can be done with the robot, and, uh, and eventually we'll be moving in that direction, I'm sure. We're out of time. It's really exciting work that you're doing there, and thank you for taking the time to come and join us and share what you're doing. It's always um, a pleasure, Ray. Right? And we'll have the information for how to contact you on at the end of the show, so thank you very much for jumping on with us today. Appreciate it very greatly. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. You've been watching Lakeland Currents where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time. For more information on the Minnesota Institute for Minimally Invasive Surgery, see the screen.